It is a huge, huge honor today. Um, I am in Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, lecturing at the South African Dental Association. And last night, my son, me, Ryan, and Greg went to dinner with a father-son dentist. And it's just a remarkable story. There's so many things I want to talk about. Um, probably three out of four dentists listening to 83% of the show um, are Americans. And 17% are from about, what is it, 140 other countries. Is it 141? 142, 142 other countries. Um, so I find the story of South Africa very fascinating. Um, you know, when you live in a um, country like America and there's 220 countries, you're only gonna hear one little thing about maybe Greece or South Africa or something, you know, maybe every month or two. It's not like, it's not like a newspaper can cover 220 countries you know, all the time. So I, I found the story of South Africa very interesting. Um, I, some of the things that I find the most interesting about South Africa is um, the United States, you have 3,500 dentists in private practice, 800 dentists in public health clinics. So there's only 4,300 dentists in a country of 53 million, which mathematically, that's only a dentist for every 12,325 people where America has a dentist for every 1,850 people. So that's like one to 2,000. You're like over one to 12,000. And planet Earth has um, two million dentists for seven billion people, which is a dentist for every 3,500 people. So my, my first question I want to ask you is, uh, how is South Africa doing? And why is there only a dentist for every 12,325 um, people? Well, well, maybe Nick can answer that better because it, it has a it has an historical background to it. Well, tell it, it, tell us the history. What's going on in well, South Africa? Maybe we should ask the guy who used to be in politics. Maybe he can tell you better. He, used, he had a very long life in politics. Maybe he can tell you. Oh, the limitation to my mind uh, was was politics. The limitation was that it was catered only for one group of people. Uh, although the del service service delivery was all o across the board, but we, they only trained. Uh, white dentists for a long period of time and uh, dentists of color came to be trained only much later. When I was a student in 1977 I qualified the first black dentists started qualifying from a black university. That's the essence. So there's a, a huge backlog. We acknowledge that fact. There's a lot of information that needs to go out there. There's a huge backlog. So what the government is trying to do is not just trying to train new dentists they also train dental therapists who are kind of an intermediary between a dentist and an oral hygienist uh, but to get more of them to do primary health care and to get into the areas where we can't reach and you were asking yesterday there were so many people and we were walking around in in Monte Cassino it looks like Vegas and you're literally seeing five percent of the population the other 95 percent you don't see because they're just not in the in the bigger bigger cities or the uh, shopping centers. So, would, would you say South Africa is really a nation of like two worlds? There's a, a rich world and a poor world. Well, how do how do I say this? Unfortunately, uh, there there uh, used to be two worlds, and those two worlds came together now. But it's still the the, the divide between the the upper ten percent and the lower ninety percent, or because we have a majority of people who can't afford. Uh, dentistry or any kind of medicine but the divide is just getting bigger and bigger because the cost of, uh, of dentistry is going up while earnings aren't going up necessarily our currency is just going downwards so the divide is getting bigger and bigger there's a there's a lot of um a lot of dental students that listen to this show so a lot of the dental students are probably only 25 years old or younger so um, apartheid was 89 to 94 so a lot of the a lot of the people listening to the show um, were weren't even born yet or don't even remember. So re, re, go go back to the history when you're, you're talking about um, what was apartheid, eighty nine to ninety four. In ninety four, that was a whole generation ago because this is now twenty sixteen. So ninety four uh, to two thousand. You know, it, it was how many years ago was ninety four from twenty sixteen? That's twenty two years ago. So a lot of these kids don't even know what you're talking about. So, but also also remember in ninety four eighty one, I was also in primary school. So. To me, it was just, I remember my father, he was one of the people who were against apartheid. And I, but I don't, I don't 
feel the impact because I was isolated as someone of, of, of privilege or from privilege. He knows a lot more about the history and the politics because if you say 89 to 94, that is where the change came. Apartheid came from the 1950s. We in, inherited that as well. As a matter of fact, it goes back way back. Apartheid goes back to colonial years. We were a colony of Brit Britain, of England, and they had this sort of colonial system introduced into South Africa. In 1948, apartheid was formalized by law. A, a white kid could not go to a black school and vice versa. And give or take, the majority of the, m the money was invested in white education. Give or take, money was invested in white health care. Give or take, money was, inv was invested in white uh, whatever. And that came, that's how I got involved in politics because I, you decided at that stage it's not a workable situation. And we had the changeover of uh, government in 1994 when uh, Nelson Mandela became president. But that didn't erase the backlog. If you, if you can compare it, it's like East Germany and West Germany becoming one Germany. They also had this problem uplifting East Germany. But West Germany was a, a very affluent community, a very rich community. So it was much more easier for them. At this moment in time, the tax burden to uplift, say, the have-nots, it's just a massive task. It's a mammoth task to uplift the areas that we would like to see uplifted. And then dentistry falls in that category. And that's the same thing I heard when I was lecturing in Asia and China, that one of the reasons the Chinese government and no one wants North Korea to really fall is because when North Korea does fall, that's going to be a massive, massive uh, cleanup. Almost the same. You can compare the, this uh, comparatives between them, yes. The, the other way to maybe put it into context is we had apartheid, which is not really a a nice word because it, it's taken directly from Afrikaans. Uh, the nice word, I suppose, is one that you had. It's segregation. That's exactly what it was. And America also had that. It, it seemed as though America was was us. Uh, maybe they were ahead of us by 10 or 20 years. But they also had the problem with segregation. And they also had the challenges. And Rosa Parks made a difference. They're like Nelson Mandela made a difference. But they came later on. And we are at that place where we have to start restoring the backlog and uplifting people and it's it's a big backlog and it's a really big and the ratio is the other way around the, the white America was the majority the white people the privileged people in South Africa were the minority so it's the minority that now has to do its and how and at the uh, peak of uh, apartheid coming apart in 94 it was almost 10 million um, Dutch, English, white, European, and now that number has fallen to about half? It's fallen to more than half, I would presume. At so, so my question is, so half of the uh, Dutch, English, European left, why did you stay? This is the most wonderful country in the world. I will not leave this country for any money in the world. I would like to stay here. I would like to make a difference here. And I think we are making a difference. My involvement in politics at that stage when I got involved in politics was just that. I wanted to make a difference here where I grew up and where the country that I love. They normally say the best dentists in the world practice in the country or the city they love. So why, why, do, you think, why do you think the other half left? They didn't share my, my view or my vision. Um, they, they, maybe they saw a threat within the black community at that stage coming to age the majority just looking so threatening at that stage living in South Africa and, and, and the change over days was not an easy place to live in you, you, you felt threatened uh, I always felt very so I speak one of their languages fluently so I always which feel one? Zulu language Zulu. which incidentally is uh, Zuma's language and I'm not a, a supporter of Zuma at all uh, so it, it helps when you get to know if you have a, a waiter or something and you address them in their language they always you feel this warmth from from the, the now you, them you, as had, a person. you had four children right yes did they all four stay I mean this is your son he stayed and became a dentist did the other three stay one is in Australia my oldest son is a lawyer in Australia well that's good the lawyer was left yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> no country needs another lawyer so that's a good thing so so tell me this um you had four children um, why, why did you follow your father, I think? Well, I, I think that comes from the earlier question. Why did he stay? Well, same question to me is, 
I was raised differently, I think. Uh, I was born into privilege not only because I'm white and one of the minority, but because he thinks the way he does, that sort of spilled over to me and, and we share the same idea of what is possible in our country and in our city, more specifically, that we can make a difference. And you, but it, you, you, can't start, you can't be on the outside of the, of the glass castle and throw rocks inside. You have to be on the inside and understand what it's about and from there you can make the change. So it is is possible. Uh, also, we're invested. It's, I was born here. I'm, unfortunately, I'm not European. I'm not. I'm African. I'm African as any other one, and our family history goes back 400 years. Well, you know what I think is funny about the word African is in America, black people call themselves African Americans. When you talk to any scientists, a hundred percent of all humans lived in Africa 70,000 years ago. So what am I supposed to say? I mean, I'm African American. I mean, you know, I mean. I mean, I, we're all African. All African. I mean, isn't that what the evidence saying? Seventy-eight thousand years ago, all Homo sapiens were in Africa. So we're all African Americans. Not far from here. Not far from here. Yeah. Is that where they found Lucy? Yes. Not, not Lucy. Not Lady. Not Lady. Yeah. Not Lady. It's the latest one they found. Is she older than Lucy? Older, and I think. Uh, where Where was she found? Very preserved at Stark Stark Fontaine. Stark Caves to close to. Uh, close to yeah. I, I honestly don't know the exact spot, but it's close to here. Yeah. Close to here. Close yeah. to. It's in Gauteng. It's maybe an hour's drive if you have to go out there, but it's it's close to here. And uh, I think she was older, and she very had preserved. traits of both Homo sapiens and Homo habilis. So it wasn't one. It's a completely new species. Wow, and I am proud to say that Lucy. Which they named her Lucy because when they found her, they were, uh, I guess Elton John was singing uh, on the radio, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yes. Was that the Beatles or Elton John? Beatles. That was Beatles. She's now right by my house at Arizona State University. She's on, she's on loan display on display there. They're studying it there. So Lucy used to be the oldest. Um, you and I have a lot in common. We both have four kids. And both of us have only one of the four that turned out good. And uh, I have to say that it was Ryan because he's over there filming. I'm just kidding. Uh, but you and I both had Sirac 1, Sirac 2, Sirac 3, Blue Cat. I mean, we've been Sirac, we've been on Sirac forever. And I gotta, and I gotta ask you, so why have you been committed? Uh, two questions I gotta ask you. Why have you been on the Sirac bandwagon for literally three decades? And number two, in my country, United States, about 95% take insurance. From what I can gather about in South Africa, it's about the same. At, 85, 95% of the people take insurance. You don't take insurance. So talk about those two things. I know it's two questions instead of one, but why do you guys not take insurance? And why are you so committed to Cirax for three decades? The start of could, could have changed. The, the reason could have changed. At that stage, I was, I was taught to amalgams. And at that stage, the conversion to composites for posterior teeth was just the most horrible route to go. They just looked horrible. And when I started reading the studies coming out uh, at that stage at university, when we were just after I qualified, uh, I, I read about this new possibility. And when it came out, I just jumped in and was the first guy to buy in South Africa. You were the first guy. Yeah, we were the first. We were six guys that went over the first time, and uh, I was so one, how, of, how one of them. Dennis in South Africa will tell me they were the first guy. Six. <laughs> we were on the same course, yeah. As a matter of fact, I trained one. Uh, so about really a you were the first guy in South Africa? Yeah, we were six. Uh, Kasper Bosman from Bloemfontein, uh, Jan. And what year was that? 1992. 19, we and bought I got in 87, and that's about when I bought Serac 1. Nine, yeah. But, and uh, So you've been, you've been committed to it the whole time? Yes. and uh, I, Upgrading was part of my business plan to go to the next level every time and that's one of the things in South Africa you should do you should just not just buy the one system and then stick to it if it upgrades you should move with it <coughs> that's a difficult one but I think a lot of people would say um, now did you buy that because I know you're you're out by Kruger um, yes. Park so you're not by the big Johannesburg is the big major city yes yeah. and then you got Cape Town and Pretoria but you're you're in small area did you buy Serac because you didn't really have access to a lab, or was it for different reasons? No, as a matter of fact, we had, at that stage, I think, three or four labs in, in my city. My city is the, the capital of my province, so it's, a, it's a, not a small town, it's a, it's a city, uh, but not the size of Johannesburg and Pretoria. 
Uh, but that's the reason why we had laboratories around us. But at that stage, the, the technology was new and new technology is expensive. And he saw something that he thought would be the future. And luckily he was right. Luckily he didn't invest in a <laughs> But like I was saying, I was, I was raised differently because uh, in private practice, we studied, you do amalgams and you do PFM crowns. But I've never done an amalgam in private practice. It's because he wouldn't let me. And I, I've never done a PFM crown or a metal crown because I only know CEREC. I can't even comment on amalgam or PFM crowns. I only know CEREC. And what are you doing now with CEREC? Are you doing Omnicam, Bluecam? What Omnicam, doing? yeah. We went through all of it. 3D and Bluecam and Omnicam, even the Apollo. We have all of it. And, and, um, and why do you not take insurance? Well, there's also a, an historical question to that, which I suppose he can answer better. Uh, but there is a decline in the availability of funds for dentistry. So in, in 1994, the percentage of insurance that went to the, to the dentist was about 14 and a bit percent. And today it's either just over 1% or just under 1%. So in 1994, 14% of the state money went to dentistry? Of insurance of money. Of insurance money, not state money. It's private insurance, not government insurance. Private insurance still, not government. So for private insurance, 14% went to dentistry yeah. in 94. Yeah. Of the and health budget, 1%. yeah. Uh, maybe maybe, maybe even less. One, but yeah, it's well, so less why, say 1%. Why, why, so why did that disappear? Uh, it's, well, uh, historically, more attention was given to hospitals and to specialists and to uh, hospital procedures, theater. And dentistry was not seen as a crucial profession. They didn't, they didn't need to have funding for that because you can live without teeth I mean, you can't live without a kidney or a liver uh, so maybe you just did not get the attention I do and think the dentists were also at fault here yeah. they sort of over treated as a matter of fact they just did a lot of work on the medical insurance Let's say again. Uh, uh, I think the dentists are also at fault here because the fees were so low, they're still very low at this point in time. And that forces the dentist who works within the ambit of medical aids or insurance, it forces them to over-treat or to treat something that's not necessary. Or to, uh, uh, we just see that all the time. So that's one of the reasons I just said, I'm not going to go that route. I want to go an ethical dental route. So prices are going up, but the benefits are going down. It's been doing that for 20 years. It's literally been declining every year since 94. Uh, but there just aren't any funds available for dentistry, either in private or public sector. As a matter of, just to prove the point or to illustrate the point, when you do a seric restoration uh, and it's, uh, you, you, you would like to bond it to a tooth and there's a fee applicable. And some medical aides argue that they don't pay that fee. So then it forces the dentist to do something else or to charge the patient. And if you work within the ambit of medical aids and you want direct payment from the medical aids or the medical insurance, you have to buy abide by their rules. And that's the difficult one. It's not clinically, it's not the clinical route that they think of. They think of money. That's the problem in South Africa. I want to ask you another, this is a complicated question. It's too long of a question, but uh, um, I, I find, for, first of all, a lot of people listening might not realize um, this is one of the high. This is the highest HIV rate of any country on earth. Is that correct? So you have about 25% HIV positive and 25% unemployment. And by the way, the um, last time America had 25% unemployment was the Great Depression, from 1932 to 36. So this has 25% unemployment, 25% HIV rate. But I want you to explain the HIV rate because what I understand is, when AIDS came out, all the healthcare community doctors use all the television advertising, radio, billboards, all this advertising inform everybody what's going on and they nipped it in the butt. Yet those same countries don't allow dentists to advertise. Why did countries allow physicians to advertise all about HIV and nip it in the butt, yet in this country Coca-Cola can advertise and candy bars can advertise, but um, a dentist can't advertise. But explain why, because it was actually your president that didn't, uh, that was kind of stalled the HIV activity. Can you talk more about that, explain that? Maybe a little bit. Uh, I'm not involved in politics anymore, but at that stage it was quite, you're quite right. 
uh, President Mbeki at that stage uh, had a lot of things to say with regards to AIDS that was very unscientific. And Minister uh, of Health. And, say again, Minister and the Minister of Health, of Health as well. You, the AIDS cure was eating beetroot and garlic. That was the AIDS cure for the time. And, so, and that, uh, as a matter of fact, it's been said that they could be charged uh, for that because that's a crime against humanity. Uh, they, they calculate that give or take 300 to 500 people lost their lives because of that policy at that stage. 300 to 500? 1,000. 300,000 to 500,000. Well, kids were born at that stage that could have been cured with, with ARVs. Uh, people who, ha who had AIDS could have been cured or treated at least. Uh, and the, direct easiest, the easiest to nip in the butt was the pregnant mother it, that was who the just had to take an antiviral and then her baby was born um, HIV negative. Yeah, they had to eat beetroot and garlic at that stage. That was the cure in South Africa. So, so that's why the rate here is so much higher than all the neighboring countries. Ma that's the one thing. And we also have a president who said after he had sex with a lady with AIDS, extramarital sex to say that, his argument is he had a shower afterwards and that cured him. That uh, released him from the fear of having AIDS. So it's just, it's just one blunder to the next, from the one president to the next. That's what we have to deal with. Now we're thinking of first world dentistry and third world dentistry and getting those two together. It's, whereas at this moment in time we don't even have prime health care. That act together as of yet. And that, that was really a, a, a national tragedy. I mean, um, I mean that, that's really why, I mean, that, those two presidents are really why the HIV rate is so high here. I would like to see one day that my president is also being charged because that's also a crime against humanity. To yeah. say something like you can shower and that will cure you of having had sex with an, uh, yeah. an infected lady. It just doesn't make sense. I must think. I must say, it must seem very odd to uh, an American to hear things like. Well, you this. know what I was also thinking is, would you say there's a shortage of dentists in South Africa? I would say there's a shortage of good dentists in South Africa. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, um, when I was in Singapore, like we met, like I, I saw this woman dentist, obviously a blonde dentist in Singapore at a dental convention. You know, she's not uh, from Singapore, and uh, she said, you know, she was the. Um, president of the um, New Mexico Dental Association been practicing 30 years and one day she just said what the hell I just want to do some you know a midlife crisis yeah. and she said I'm gonna go practice in Singapore for a year next thing you know she's been there five years when you see these game preserves when you see this country it's so gorgeous I'm telling you if you're in the United States and you're having a midlife crisis or you're single or you don't know what to do this has got to be one of the coolest countries I've ever seen in my life. Are you guys hiring right now? If one of my homies wants to move to uh, South Africa, would you give him a job? For sure. Yeah, sure. Come on out. For sure. <laughs> We've got a job for him. Yeah. Let him just come. Yeah. But uh, but again, it's this is my home. I'm I'm not from Europe. I I probably won't adapt to Europe. I won't adapt to America. I'm African. We don't need to go to heaven. We're living next to it. Yeah. We're living in, in our own African heaven. It is. I, I agree. And uh, tomorrow I get to go um, kind of near where you guys live um, to do that uh, Kruger National Park. Uh, Ryan, me, and Greg are doing that uh, uh, photo safari. Uh, while, while we're on the, uh, the safari, i got to ask you one uh, politically incorrect question. Um, probably the most famous dentist in America is a Dr. Palmer who came over here to your neighboring country, Zimbabwe, and shot Cecil the Lion. My question to you is you guys live next to Kruger National Park. You guys are here. Some people in America say, well, you know, big game hunting is necessary for some of these economies. What, what are your thoughts about big game hunting? And big game is, uh, what is it, uh, water buffalo, I mean, a cape buffalo, elephant, lion, leopard, um, lion, rhinoceros. What, what, do you, what do you think of big game hunting? What do, you, what do you think of, first of all, specifically, what do you think of Dr. Palmer coming from America to Zimbabwe shooting seeds line? And in general, what do you think of big game hunting? Well, Let me start off. A, he is a hunter. I am a hunter. And I, I, I'm one of my biggest, the biggest love in my life, apart from my Mac, is my bow tech. My bow tech bow, my compound bow. I love my bow. But we have a diff I have a different way of looking at it. I'm, I'm not really a fan of trophy hunting, so we only hunt what we can eat. But there's also a reason for that, and it's also uh, traditional or historical, is that not a lot of people have access 
to meet. They can't get... So whatever we shoot, we always give half of it away uh, to, to people in need because there is, we need food. So it's not about, you can't, you can't share a trophy, but you can give out meat and food. Um, but the, the Cecil, maybe it's blown out of proportion because there is some value in, in culling, in, in keeping the, uh, the numbers intact. And we get that in the Kruger Park, especially when the population of the elephants get out of hand, they start destroying everything. They destroy the landscape. So there has to be a certain amount of elephants per square kilometer. More than that, they destroy everything. And that's even worse than having no, well, killing an elephant, which I won't do, but for different reasons. So it's, I think in our country, the setting is a little bit different than America because we have people who are in desperate need of food. So hunting is a necessity. Trophy hunting is also a necessity for them because it's, it's income, which we want. We want the Americans to come and hunt in, in our beautiful country. But there are right ways of doing it and there are wrong ways of doing it. So I think, Dr. Palmer, there's a lot of, because it was, it was one of our, 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 our PAs that went on the hunt with him. There's a lot of rumors of... You, you know one of the guys that went on the no, hunt? No, I don't, but he was he's South African who, who oh. took him on the hunt, the professional hunter. And there's a lot of speculation that they lure Cecil out of the game reserve because then it's not necessarily illegal, but you're not allowed to lure him out. So there's, there's a lot of questions regarding that. But as a, as a profession, or I, I don't see a problem with it because there, there is, there's a law, or there are laws governing it, and that's important. Because at the moment, we are losing the population of rhinos in South Africa, which can be solved if it's regulated. At the moment, there's a total ban on hunting in rhinos, so they are being poached, so we lose them all. I read in the paper today that there is a moratorium placed on the hunting of leopards for 2016, which means there's a limitation on hunting the big five for 2016. And it comes partly from Cecil. They want to protect the numbers, but they also want to stop the hunting just for a year so the numbers can, can restore again. But then it will continue again, I suppose, from next year. Uh, they, they'll see. Um, I want to talk about something else. Um, what was the name of the photo safari I did because it started with a P? Pilansburg. Uh, uh, Pilansburg? Yeah. Um, someone, there was a fluoride mine by there. A fluoride mine? Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and um, fluoride, um, well, Dr. Palmer is probably the most controversial thing in dentistry after shooting Cecil. <laughs> but I would say when that blows over, it's always back to fluoride. So in the United States, there's 19,000 towns and 70% are adjust to fluoride and 30% have voted it out or whatever. Uh, I noticed in South Africa, just walking around here and going to those areas that obviously there must be some areas where the fluoride is naturally about two parts per million. And there's, cause I see some people walking around with two part per million, three part per million fluorosis. Um, and then, so what is the um, status of uh, naturally occurring fluorosis? And a lot of people um, that, um, you know, this is on iTunes and YouTube, so sometimes non-dentists listen to this, but a lot of people think that um, if you fluoridate the water and there is fluoridose, that makes the teeth weak and brittle and break down, and that dentists are for that because whenever there's fluorosis, then they all have to come in and have expensive crowns put on their teeth. So I want to ask you specifically, are there areas of naturally occurring fluorosis? And when you see those patients, their teeth are brown, but do they have... Do they have less cavities and root canals and crowns? Is it just a cosmetic issue? Or is the teeth brittle and weaker and more likely need expensive crown and bridge in dentistry? My dad grew up in the, in the Karoo, which is a natural fluoride area. And he had, he did not have one restoration in his mouth when he died at the age of 87. So there's, that's that natural area for, of fluoride. And how, how heavy do you think it was in the water? How many parts per million do you think it was? I, I'm not no, even sure. No way of I'm, not, I'm not even sure. But he came. So were his teeth brown? He had spots on them, but not Age brown. Age appropriate, maybe. Age appropriate, Age yeah. appropriate, I was saying. Yeah. But they, we do have the areas in the country where there is an excessive amount of fluoride naturally occurring in the water. And those are the people you're talking about. But they're also the people who come from underprivileged community so they can't afford big treatment 
So we try and get those people away from fluoride by any means. You're gonna get in, you're gonna get fluoride you ingest it anyway. Just lower doses. So when I I talked to I, I found a gentleman here that wrote a uh, I took a picture of um, this guy here wrote a book he, he got a PhD in dentistry and he wrote a uh, a book on it do you recognize this guy No I can't even see it <laughs> And he was saying that the uh, these areas with a lot of fluorosis it's about two part per million so the ocean's one point four when we put it in a city water supply we put in half the level of ocean point seven but there's still just 30% of Americans, they literally believe that, you know, so here it is, two part per million, but you're saying the teeth don't need cap, don't get cavity. You're saying the teeth are better, they just look bad. Well, we know with extreme fluorosis that you do start getting chipping of the enamel. We, we know that. And the people with fluorosis we see seldomly have any fillings due to caries. They might have, uh, they might require restorations because of that extreme hardness or brittleness you get from advanced fluorosis but you can't bond to fluorose teeth so you end up doing cemented crowns which might even be better to, to leave the patient as is but that just depends on the aesthetics if they want that to change then you can do that but from the area they, they're from usually it's accepted because that is that's put kind of the way of the world for them but what would you say to the people listening to this on YouTube that say that fluoridated water is a communist plot and the dentists bribe the government officials to put fluoride in the water so that all the teeth break down so that we sell them expensive dentistry? To add on to that, the political scene in South Africa way back in the apartheid days, uh, the black community saw it as mass medication and they saw it as a threat that we were giving them contraceptives or something of sort. So there was a major political move away from it. The people did not accept it politically to have water fluoridated. It was a political thing back in 77. There's a paper out in 77 on water fluoridation on this political issue. I think, yeah. I think the new fluoride concept today is vaccination because there's a, a whole lot of opinions on should you or should you not vaccinate. It's the same thing with fluoride, I think. And there's differing science on it, differing research, differing, uh, differing outcomes. Well, you know, when I, um, I was involved in the uh, fluoridation of Phoenix back in 1987, it was unfluoridated when I got there. So me and the dean of the local dental school, Jack Nellenberg, started the Arizona Citizens for Dental Health. We got a fluoridated. But anyway, so it came down to eight city councilmen would vote and then the mayor voted. The only person who voted against it was the only um, black uh, mayor. And he literally told me, he said, um, you want this because when there's fluoride in the water, it, it causes sickle cell anemia. So I got experts on sickle cell anemia to explain to him what sickle cell was and how it was genetic and it was inherited and nothing to do with water fluoridation. But it all comes back to what I believe, now that I'm 53, I believe it, it all comes from a deep m warranted mistrust in government. It, oh, at the end of the day, it's all about trust. They don't trust the government agencies. They don't trust the government. They don't, they don't, I, I see half a century living on this rock. I just see a lot of people for a lot of good reasons that have just lost trust in public institutions, trust in government. Like I see a lot of people here, I can't tell you how many doctors have um, told me here that they think your president takes on um, bribes or kickbacks. I mean, I mean, and we see that in America. I think that's the rise of Donald Trump it's not so much that they think Trump's a good guy. It's just they're they're sick and tired of the of the two party system, the Democrats, Republicans. So I, I think when you tell these people that the Centers for Disease Control says all these good things about vaccinations, well, at the end of the day, they don't even trust the Centers for Disease Control. Yeah. They just they're just a lack of trust. I mean, what what do you think? What do you think doctors and dentists and physicians around the world need to do to gain trust back with the people? I think, again, for South Africa, this is a different environment because the, um, the comment that some people think that our president takes bribes is actually incorrect. It is proven that he does. <laughs> uh, the uh, public prosecutors have found that he has a corrupt relationship with certain businessmen. So it's a fact. And that is no where... Doubt the, about that. There's no doubt about it. So there is there's a starting point for mistrust, but also historically, the, the majority of the country had to trust a new government. So there's, on all levels, there's, there's, there's mistrust. Also from, from the food side, if you have, you have the water fluoridation, but you also in America especially, 
you have the sugar controversy should you or should you not and the only thing that might cure that is time one day we'll see uh, maybe we should have or we shouldn't have but there's no way to predict one way or the other but you're right it comes down to to the trust public trust or the trust of the government it's difficult at the moment it's very volatile politically so we don't even get to the water fluoridation uh, topic at the moment now, now I want to ask you a very politically incorrect question but um do you, do you mind giving away your age I'm turning 38 on Thursday okay so 38 <laughs> 38 we'll buy him a drink uh, for his birthday we're always good for that we'll buy you a beer and by the way we had so much fun at dinner with you guys last night um but I'm going to ask you a very politically incorrect question because you're sitting next to your father. There's a lot of kids, uh, the big fans of these podcasts, it's a lot of dental students. And when I go around the world, about 25, about a quarter to a third of the dentist, it's a family deal. They, um, you, you go to a dental school, how many of you have a mom, dad, uncle, cousin, grandma, grandpa that's a dentist? And one fourth to one third of the hands go up. And it doesn't matter if you're in America, India, Brazil, it's a very family occupation. A lot of these kids are in school thinking I don't know if this is gonna work because my old man he believes this like like he does root canals with Sir Jenny root canal paste paraformaldehyde and I don't believe in that but I can't really how do you tell your old man dad that ain't right and what how, how do you how do you work with your dad and what do you do because families first friends I mean all you want is they, they say the only three things you want in life is family friends and good food so how do you work with your family? How, what, how do you, what is your conflict negotiation? How does that work? Well, it's, it's, do, do you want me to have your dad leave the room for this part of the answer? No, it's, it's a good question. Um, we, we do refer to him as the, as the silverback because he's graying. But like I was saying, I was raised differently and he, he forces me to put myself in an uncomfortable position because that's the only way you can grow and, and, and move forward. So there's, there's no conflict. The conflict is usually just to how to handle conflict. But at, at least we think the same way. But from, from my side with the CERIC training and at university, I have a great, great love for students because they, they are new to the profession and you can't really teach an old dog new tricks. But you can teach the younger guys that the profession is amazing. But they have to look at the science and they have to get involved with technology. So it's kind of like teaching an old guy to use a cell phone. It's difficult for my mum and it's difficult for him to a point. And that is the frustration to me is the, the gap in technological savvy that you'll get with the younger people will have it as a, as a standard. They'll have it where the older people will, it'll kind of die out because you might know it or might not know it, but he grew up without electricity. That's how far back he goes. Me, I, I was raised differently. I was raised in technology. The first iteration I ever did was a CEREC, before I even did amalgam. So I was raised in that environment. This is what I specifically hear. <clears throat> I want to go in and work with my dad. It'd be a great opportunity. But you know what? I'm his baby. And I don't care if I work for him for 20 years. I'm always going to be the baby. He's always going to be dad. They're sitting on the fence. Should I go to work with dad and be the baby, even though when I'm 38 years old, I'll still be the baby. What, what advice would you give them if they're sitting on the fence? Like, should I go in with dad? Should I not? What, what, are, what are the pros and cons? Well, I, can, I should answer this because we have, as the younger dentists, we have this problem that we don't compare ourselves to other young dentists. We compare ourselves to the successful dentists. So immediately we, and we want to achieve that. But I, I, I don't think there's a gap though. I just think it's, it's something you can aspire to because this is the best learning school in the world. If you, have a, if you have a family member who is in the profession, that is a better learning school than a university. And that's what I got. I got all that knowledge. So the next generation should be better off. And that's what happened here because I was able to achieve in less than 10 years what took him 30 years to achieve. And that's not because I'm special. It's so how many he, how gave many, me the, he gave me the opportunity. How many years have you worked for your dad? 10, 11. And how many times have you had to go to mom to be the tiebreaker? Oh, no. No, no. <laughs> we don't I, get mom into the practice. No, no, no. That's maybe I there. should also fill in a little bit here. And I'm very proud of this stance, maybe. And that is that uh, I told him that 
there could be no difference in our practice with regards to the quality of work. So that I thought my quality was there and he needed to get his there. And he got his quality there. He's got his quality there at this moment in time. And what he did uh, in the interim, he qualified himself further with regards to uh, endodontic treatment. And uh, I refer my endo to him now because he's got a postgraduate uh, registration with regards to endodontics. And at this moment in time, I don't like to do surgery. And he does guided surgery with the CEREC, and I refer that to him. So in a certain instance, he's my superior. He's my superior with regards to endodontics now. And don't to guided surgery. love hearing that? Uh, and I'm proud of him taking that baton on. And uh, he can't do a crown like I do. And I pride myself on my preps. And uh, I'm still, I still want to see his preps as beautiful as mine. And I want to take a note to say that this podcast would not be made available if my son Ryan over there wasn't uh, helping his old man. I don't know a damn thing. I don't know how this is done. People always say to me, how do you do a podcast every day? And it's like, well, I think it's fun because you just get to meet really cool homies and talk dentistry for now. I think it's a blast, but uh, he's a man who does it all. So um, talk about Sirac. Um, some people, um, talk about how you went from Sirac to guided surgeries and implants. Well, it- I think every every dentist nowadays wants to have a label. You're an aesthetic dentist, or you're an endodontist, or an implantologist, and I, we we don't have that. But if I must label myself as something, it is to do with technology and CAD CAM. And it might have started out as Seric being CAD CAM, and it was it's always the go-to part of the profession if you talk about CAD CAM or computerized. It's Seric, but it has so many branches. It's got imaging and radiology, and it has laser and and now guided surgery is in the second generation seri guide one was a little bit cumbersome seri guide two is just amazing and the science out there says that it's it's more accurate with guided surgery if you place an implant which i would advise for the younger guys the, the one thing that i'm 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 actually sad of is what took him the one thing you can't buy is experience but what took him 30 years to achieve and to learn with that muscle memory we probably won't get to to get that you know that that sort of uh, I, I want to say quality but we won't get that experience because technology is making it easier so I can place an implant probably easier than anyone has ever done it before and that is the the combination that my colleague said that guided implantology is literally the combination or the culmination of 200 years worth of research and technology in dentistry because it brings digital imaging, scanning, radiology, CBCT, uh, implants, it brings it all together and this is like the precipice of what we've reached at the moment. Yeah, I suppose stem cells will be the next thing but it's just an amazing, I love the technology, I love where Seric takes you because they're just a whole lot of integrated products, it's not just the one thing, it's the fact that there are so many of their products that integrate and work together that make this the technology awesome. So um, when you do implants, um, talk about what your, the, the average case is. I mean, are you usually doing a single root form for a single tooth replacement? Or are you talking about doing over you know, two implants for over dentures? Or are you talking about four on floor? What, what, is, what is your average implant case? Well, it's, it's at the moment single cases. Because I, I didn't enter the, uh, the, the profession of implantology because of implantology. I entered it because of CAD CAM. So I'm not going to invest my life into implantology. So the single simple cases are, are good for me. But we have, a, we, have a, we have quality controls and we are four colleagues at the moment. And if you want to place an implant, at least two people have to sign off on it. So we have we, in we check practice? in our practice. So we have to check ourselves. I would do a planning or he would refer a patient. Present I would do the, the planning, case. present the case. And we have a, a bunch of like eight or 10 dentists we come, we come together on a monthly basis and then we discuss. Here's my case and here's the planning, here's the x-ray, the CBCT. And then we discuss the case and the people ask a lot of questions. And yeah, maybe you can move the implant. Maybe you can do this as a clinical step. And then we all agree and everyone can bring a case. And then we move on. I think with CAD CAM, the only thing you did is the procedure is easier. But you still have to go back to planning. And if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So that we give a lot of attention to that the, the planning stage of of anything whether it's an endo or a crown or an implant everything goes through a whole lot of discussion 
and that I think is key. So what what I noticed about the the um, CAD CAM with the Sierra, uh, Serac, Serona, or now Densply Serona, is that when you have a, a one system, when you have the CAD CAM, when you have the Galileo, when you have one closed system, it's kind of like Apple. It just seems like it's a lot easier. They just get it done. But when you start mixing a CAD CAM um, system from, say, Plan Mecca, and a CBCT from, say, CareStream, and you start mixing all these companies, it just seems to be you really have to be a lot more tech savvy. And at the end of the day, a lot of people, a lot of less people just get her done. But it seems like having the one system, would you agree that by having the Galeos and the CAD CAM um, and the, the um, surgical guide milling? You feel, you feel comfortable. That it just, at the end of the day, it's just easier to get it all done. Yeah, yes. and it's exactly the point. It, maybe for the younger guys, it's easier to learn a new technology. If you're in, in a company like Serona, everything is built on one principle. So the maybe just the look and feel of one CAD CAM system is carried over to the next. So you always keep the feel of the software. So you don't have the old people having to learn anything new, anything completely new. They, they just build on the existing knowledge. But it might be easier for younger guys to be able to learn everything. They FaceTime and they podcast and they do everything all at once. They multitask. Yeah, Ryan could do it. Yeah, no, they, they no can do it. Problem, maybe not even. I'm pushing 40. Maybe but not I'm even me. Yeah. It's extremely confusing. Me. But it and might I've be been, easier for them to do it. And I've been in so many dental offices where someone will say, "Well, can you print out that um, that CBCT for me?" And here's three dental assistants, and no one knows. And then they go to the dentist, and no one. And it's always some little. It's just, there's always this one little thing where when you show them, they go, oh, that was easy, yeah. but they just didn't know. Yes. It seems like when you go into these closed system deals, whether it be Mac, iPhone, then Splice Serona's, CAD CAM, Galileo, it just seems like it's easier to do. But if you were Orion, it wouldn't matter, but for a me, whose technology challenge, it would be a bigger issue. I just think the other thing that maybe adds the value to it is that if you have the, the one company system, or it, the research is being done in-house. They've got all the research and they publish their research. And I do think it's just, I'm comfortable using the one, the closed system as we do. So now uh, that then, so what are you um, agnostic to the titanium or do you like a specific implant company? And does that, will that change now that Serona merged with Densply? Because Densply has a couple of implants. What, what implant system are you using? Uh, I'm using Champion implants. It happened by chance. It was uh, it was totally by chance. But we uh, we like with any company. I think you you become close with the company. You become friends. But the 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 MD from that company had this very nice thing to say that all of the implant systems work and they've got research. The one variable is the dentist and his skill and his knowledge. And that's where more work needs to be done. And the same thing with uh, one of the big bosses from Serona, Volker. He also, he, he wants competition and he likes competition. And he doesn't want the competition to be bad, he just wants to be better. He wants their product to be better. So all the CAD CAM systems work. They can all do, every system can do a crown, every system can do an inlay. Most implant companies have uh, guided surgery now. Uh, the, the good thing would be to keep it in house, to have one system That's to do it. everything. That's Champion Implants, yeah. I never even heard of it. That is so amazing. I had to come all the way to South Africa to hear of an implant system. So well, to, be, to be fair, I'm lazy, so I like the minimally invasive procedure that they have. I'm not, I don't want to do the big cases. And you know the owner of this? Uh, I don't know the owner, I know of him, but the, uh, the director in South Africa is Andr Dr. Andre Petsch, and he lives in Cape Town, or in Somerset West. He lives in the Western Cape, and he's, it's a German company. They are actually close to Serona in Benzheim, close to Frankfurt. Nice. So my, um, I've only got a few more minutes with you, and it's over. Um, so just tell me now, what, what, um, what's got you excited in dentistry? Um, what, what are you passionate about now? Um, I, 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 when I ask the young kids, and I say, when I go to dental schools, and I say. What, what, are you, what, what are you most excited about dentistry? Why, why do you think dentistry is better than other careers? It seems like the major answer they always tell me, at least half the times, they'll say, you know, my, my sister works at a desk job and she sits in a cubicle and she does the same task over and over. And being a dentistry is that, you know, it's, it's never boring. Every patient's different. Every tooth's different. It's, it's so, you know, they, they like the... Um, and you might be able to do implants or ortho or fillings or pediatrics. You know, it's so diverse, it's not monotonous. But you're 38, 
um, you'll be doing this for many, many more years. What, what's got you passionate now? What, what, do you, what, what gets you excited about still wanting to be a dentist after all these years? I think I, think I mentioned it already. The one thing is the technology because I, I can only imagine where it's taking us next. And every time a dentist has a question of a problem, the nice thing is to tell them that it's already being looked at. But what I'm, what I'm really passionate about, I think, is the younger generation. I'm looking forward to them coming out and maybe it's at the expense of the older guys, but I want the new generation of dentists to come out because we are going to start learning from them techno technologically, I suppose. But I'm really, I'm, I'm looking forward to the younger guys coming through and I'm really passionate about trying to get them to, to move along. I'm also on the National Council and that's also one of the things I, I want to do is to get the young dentists to become involved and to be able to get the, the technology because the older guys can afford it, the younger guys want it, but we can't afford it necessarily. So I would just like the younger guys to be able to get to get into the, the technological part of the profession, which is, it, it changed my life and it shaped my life. And I would want it to do the same for them. And you know, that's when people come to me and they say like, um, I get this question a lot, like, do you think I should buy a laser? And I always tell them the same thing, you know, there's oral health needs and there's mental health. And I know some of my four boys, if I put them in the bathtub when they were little with no toys, they'd be out in two minutes. But if I threw a bunch of boats and trucks and Tonka toys in the bathtub or the sandbox or the beach, they'd be there all day. And I always, I always think the most important thing about lasers, CAD cams, CBCTs, is if it gets you excited and passionate about dentistry, you have to have it. Because the flip side of that is burnout, disease, depression. I hate my job. I only do it for money. And then they start eating Vicodin and drinking beer and going home and getting drunk. And the next thing you know, in America, um, almost 18% of all dentists during their 40-year career will go to in treatment for alcohol. Well, well, substance abuse. Of that, it's about 85% alcohol. 15% will be narcotics, other stuff or whatever. But it, it seems to me that... The best thing about CAD CAM, I wouldn't really so much argue that maybe it's for your patient that your CAD CAM is doing something that a great crown and bridge guy couldn't do. What I think it's the best for is it just got you excited and passionate about I dentistry. Love do I love doing it and I love going to work. And I, I did a case the other day and when I finished, the patient said, he's not going to pay me. And I thought, how can you say that? Because he said, no, because you're enjoying it so much, it can't be seen as work. <laughs> and that was, the, that was a wonderful, it was a wonderful compliment, but it's exactly how I feel. Like you can go to work, every day is a new day, you're doing something different every day, and of the whole process, even if it's CAD CAM, I enjoy every single step of it, even the CAD CAM part, or the, the computer part, and the patient part, and the prep, I enjoy the whole thing. So it's, it's a just it's an amazing experience for me to go to work, and be able to do what I love doing, even if it's just after 10 years of being in the profession. And the same question to you, what's got you passionate and excited about dentistry? I must say the privilege I have is that I'm living my dream and that is dentistry and I've enjoyed it ever since and I'm enjoying it even more and it becomes more enjoyable every day. And I do think maybe it's the way we practice it as, as well. We don't, have, we don't want volumes, we don't want to see 40 patients a day. If I could see one or two patients a day, that's sufficient to me. As a matter of fact, I enjoy seeing four a day, two in the morning and two in the afternoon. So I feel like I'm living my dream and I'm passionate next to the patient with regards to what I'm doing with him, same as maybe to reiterate what he's saying. And that's the thing that if you see the patient acceptance of the treatment and if you take the patient step by step on what you're doing, they just don't understand that how you can, how can other people say that dentistry is a maybe a dull profession. It is the most wonderful wonderful profession on earth. If I can convince anybody, and I've convinced quite a number of kids to do the industry, and they come and say thank you, every one of them, after they've done it. As a matter of fact, some of them are working for us at this moment. Well, I'm proud of uh, two of my dental assistants. A big shout out to Elena Gutu, Kelly Bradley. Those are two dental assistants of mine that are now dentists. I'm very proud of those two, even though they made all their own luck. But I want to say, um, I would say that you said something very profound that you're not on an insurance mill seeing 40 people a day that you're, you don't know, take insurance. I, I think a lot of dentists are burned out because they, they you know, they, they take this insurance and the, the fees, half the fees, they lose money on the procedure and barely make money. What would you say to someone who's 30 years old, burned out, hates dentistry, primarily because they take this insurance 
and the fees are so low they have to do really quick appointment fillings extractions amalgams and they just hate dentistry and they're burned out but they're afraid they're scared to give up their 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 insurance check well, well i said one thing in, in the lecture we had yesterday is you can't be good or the best at everything so pick one thing and i like america because america the guys are quite specialized the the I know very little about general dentists in America, but you see the the more specialized versions of it coming out, and and that's it. You have to find what you love, and you have to do that. And there was a I know there's a story of a professor in America when when he was asked what should I do with my life, the professor said, "Don't do anything for money. Do what you love. Do it well, and people will pay you to do it." And it's the same with the industry. You can't be good at everything. I'm very happy that I'm not good with orthodontics because I don't want to do it. But I love CAD CAM and maybe that's it. It's not about accepting a benefit from a third party funder. It's doing what you love, whether you get paid a lot for it or not. If you become good at it, people will pay you more. So we did it and he started long before I even joined him to move away from the third party funders. It's not an overnight thing. It took him 10 years. And it's, it's a battle every day because you have to educate the patients that the payment is their responsibility and not the responsibility of a third party funder. And that's a, it's not something that happens overnight, it's a decades long hard work. And, it, and I'm reaping the benefits. He had to struggle through those years. So again, I'm not special, I'm very privileged to the position I am in it. But uh, maybe it's that, like you say, I want to take control of my own life. And if you are dependent on a third party funder to do that, you have no independence. In fact, you are working for someone else. You're working for someone who is willing to pay you a certain amount of money to do a certain procedure according to their rules. So our surgeon says that you have to take control. You dictate the treatment because you are the doctor. But it's difficult and it takes time to educate the patients. And I'm lucky that he started long before I got there. So you guys were lecturing yesterday? Yeah. And what was your lecture on? Uh, on CAD CAM. We are lecturing tomorrow again. Uh, it's CAD CAM and the, some procedures and so on. But CAD CAM in general, looting cements. He's talking about materials tomorrow. Uh, on, we lectured on CAD CAM. Well, will you do me a huge honor? Dental Town has um, over 350 courses. They've been viewed from all over. It's embarrassing that um, most of our CE courses were put up by Americans. It would be, I see Dental Town as international. Yes. And I do not have a course from a dentist from South Africa. It would just be a huge honor to have a CAD CAM course from you uh, put up on uh, Dental Town. Um, I also want to tell you that. There's hundreds of dental schools around the world in Brazil, India, and Asia where these online C courses on their smartphone are a huge portion of their curriculum. So you'd be educating dentists all around the world, but it would really add a lot of international prestige to our little dental town community to have a course by you guys. Do you think we could ever do that? Yeah, definitely. We'll be honored to participate. Yeah, we'll be participate. honored to do it. Definitely. Anything you guys want. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, man. I can't wait. But uh, seriously, guys, uh, thank you for all that you do for dentistry. Thank you for all your passion. I think you uh, gave uh, a lot of great information and a lot of good positive karma and motivation uh, to a bunch of dentists, especially a bunch of dental students. But uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, can't wait to have a beer with you again tonight. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Thanks a lot. See you tonight. Okay, bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Ryan. <laughs>